get started. Okay, so you're working on PS6 and it's due tomorrow, Saturday, depending on your late days. And um, and then there won't be a PS7 for a while. PS7 will be due in two weeks, and of course the midterm is a week from today. Will you still give out the problems with this Friday? I will, okay, so he just asked, when will PS7 come out? Yeah, I plan to, I plan to release it uh, tomorrow. But it's not due for two weeks, but yeah, it'll be there. Uh, I, on Caddis, you can find the sample midterm. Uh, look in the schedule for next week. Uh, sample midterm and uh, the fact that you can bring one page of notes to the midterm. <coughs> Go in front and back, printed or handwritten, whatever. And the midterm will cover everything measured uh, through last week, first six weeks of classes, plus the first six assignments. The only exception to that is we did do some slides on Monday about the one of the cast, one of the assignments from last week. The, um, boring. Boring problem. So those slides are clearly relevant. Any questions or problems about anything? Okay. For the CADIS problem, I want to mention an, uh, one thing that's tripping some students up and uh, that I've forgotten about is the uh, you know the CADIS problem involves corridors between intersections and there can be more than one corridor between a pair of intersections. Okay? So in terms of a graph, that means there could be more than one edge between two vertices. So technically speaking, that's a multigraph. That shouldn't, it doesn't matter to Dijkstra's algorithm, but it may matter to your graph representation. So uh, I've had a number of students getting run by errors, and I believe it's because they were representation and assume that it was not a multi so Keep that in mind. Seems like the ones that do work should have been broken by this. No, I don't I don't I don't think you have to change anything about Dyke's algorithm to deal with a multi -trail. You that being said, you can't use straight Dyke's algorithm as a problem for two reasons. One is Factors on the edges multiply, they don't add. And second of all, you're looking for the largest possible factor, not the smallest possible factor. So you sort of got to turn things, turn things around. Yes? And also you initialize the distance to zero instead of the distance. Initialize what? The distance range to zero instead of the distance. Well, yeah, so yeah, because if you're trying to maximize something, you don't want to set the distance to is your answer everywhere. So yeah, be sure to think about the problem. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so we're going to continue now talking about uh, number theory algorithms because we're trying to build up to, to uh, public key encryption. And I just remember what we, I want to remind you what we've looked at. So we, uh, you know, we've been talking about modular arithmetic, and uh, we've looked at several algorithms. So one was modular arithmetic, so that's just the problem of computing x to the y mod n. Now, in in, in what your model should be that these numbers are really long. So for RSA, we're talking about numbers that are um, you know, roughly 2,000 bits long. In terms of digits, divide that by about three. So, you know, 650 digits long. So these are large numbers. Imagine taking a, a 600 digit number to a 600 digit power. That would be impossible to compute exactly. 
But we don't have to do that. We're taking a 600 digit number to a 600 digit power mod a 600 digit modulus. So our answer is going to be 600 digits or less. And that is possible. And the basic, what, what was the basic idea of both, of both the recursive and the iterative algorithms? What's the key idea behind modular exponentiation? Okay. It's congruent, so we can mod every time we do a multiply. Okay, so the, the key idea is you can you can do it. You, you, you can do both. The algorithms work by doing uh, a handful of operations per bit in the exponent. So for each bit in the exponent, you either do a, you either do a squaring and a multiplication, or you just do a squaring. And what makes this possible is after you've done the squaring and the multiplication, you do a mod. And so the numbers never get very big. So you have to do one operation, or a, a, you know, a, we, we call these two things single operations. You do a single operation per bit. So your numbers, your numbers never grow very big. So what's the complexity of modular exponential? So it's a number of bits, so that's little n, and then each times multiplication, which is, which, which multiplication are we using? Okay, so let me, let me tell you what he said first. It's, you're doing something per bit, so that's, if, if the number of bits is little n, then that's n steps. And then for each step, we've got to do uh, modular multiplication, basically. Okay? So modular multiplication involves the regular multiplication and then a regular division. So the question becomes, uh, what's the complexity of a modular multiplication? Okay, yeah? Can you go up with n squared? Okay, so uh, multi mo modular, divi mo modular multiplication is certainly O of n squared. <coughs> and so that gives us O of n cubed as an upper bound. Now, I have thought for a long time, because of something I read in your book years ago, that uh, modular multiplication <coughs> Since it involved a division, couldn't be done faster the way like Karasuba multiplication works. But turns out I, I was wrong about that. Uh, you can do faster division, so you could do fast. So O of n cubed, in other words, is an is an upper bound. If you if the numbers are long enough, you can start using faster division algorithms, just like you can use faster multiplication algorithms and get the upper bound down. Uh, for the bit links we're talking about, uh, you know, a couple thousand bits. Something like Karasuba multiplication would make a difference, but not a huge one. So anyway, we'll just say O of n cubed and with the idea that you can actually do a little bit better. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to ask this. So then we should be considering n of 2 point n to 2 <coughs> 5, 9, or whatever uh, Karasuba was being said. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Repeat? Well, we, he was just saying that uh, if you did fast division, if, as the bits get long, you could do it in O of n to the log 2 of 3 or, or better. It just depends on what division algorithm you use, what multiplication and division algorithm you use. Okay, so here's the thing. Students often get confused between the magnitude, since we're working on numbers here, working on, on, on integers. And, and They'll get, you'll get, you tend to get confused on the magnitude of the integers you're working with versus their bit length. When we talk about the complexity of an operation, what depend, we want to express the complexity in terms of the length of the inputs, not in terms of the magnitude of the inputs. So, yes, this operation is O of n cubed. If you want to express that in terms of x, y, or n, which we're assuming are roughly the same length, then it's O of log, it's log cubed of y. It's the cube of the log of y. Okay? Because the, we're interested in the length of the numbers. The length of the number is its log. So if you want to do it in terms of y, log 3 of y. If you want to say n is the length of y, then it's n cubed. So sometimes students will come up with algorithms they think are linear because they're, you know, let's say it's O of y where y is a parameter to the, to the algorithm. But actually, that's exponential, because you need to express the running time in terms of the length of the end. Got a question? Later. We'll see. We'll see examples.
terms of this coming up. How yeah. big is log three of y? It's not one of it's not one we've dealt with before. Well this is log log x three. This is log of y. Oh, log of y. Yeah. Yeah. How big is log two of y cube? Well the base doesn't matter because we're using big O. Oh, right. It's just a cube of a log.
Well, we're assuming that the mod operation is n squared. n is the original length of the, unit, of the numbers. The problem, the thing is that the numbers get shorter, and so the mod operations get cheaper as you go along because the numbers get shorter. So those two things, uh, it just turns out that uh, you don't hit this theoretical worst case ever. And so you have an n squared algorithm. Yeah? Can the mod be cheaper than n squared as well? So we can get less than n squared? Well, I, we didn't even take the fact that we could do the mod in faster than n squared time. So in that case, would it be like, it's an n squared be like n to the... Yeah, I, don't, yeah I, guess I, don't, I haven't looked into the details, so I don't want to... Yeah, but I think, yes, using a faster division operation, you could do better than n squared. There you go. <laughs> Is that the Fourier way? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, so... Another piece we needed was my That's what we started on last time. And that's what we'll pick up here. And remember, the modular multiplic of inverse of a number A, modulo n, is just some x, such that A times x is 1, or if you're working mod n. And we looked at a bunch of examples, so I'll just repeat them right there. You know, just to pick this one. The inverse of 9 mod 11 is 5. Because 9 times 5 is 45. 45 mod 11 is, is 1. Now, what would be another inverse of 5? What other integer can we multiply 9 by and get 1 marking working mod 11? Yeah? 55? What? 55? Well, where did 55 come from? Multiply by the, the mod. Yeah, I don't believe. No, 55 wouldn't work. Or, oh. Yeah? 16. Okay, he said 16, and we're, that's correct. Where did 16 come from? 5 plus 11. Right. You can use any number here that is equal to 5 mod 11. Right? So 5 works, 16 works, 27 works, 38 works, negative 6 works, negative 17 works, and so on. So what we prefer, when I ask this question, I prefer not to see negative, you know, negative number as the answer, and I don't want to see a number bigger than the modulus as the answer. So the, the preferred form is to give a number between 0 and the modulus. But technically, there's an infinite number of possible answers, because there's an infinite number of numbers that are equivalent to 5 if you're, if you're mod 11. Now, we also saw that you, sometimes the modulus does not exist. I mean, not the modulus. The inverse does not exist. And in fact, it doesn't exist if, if, if these two numbers are relatively prime, like they are here. There is an inverse. If they are not relatively prime, in other words, they have a factor in common other than one, in this case two, there is no inverse. The inverse does not have to exist. Yeah? I know that we're working with like the mod as an operator and the mod as like a yeah. Parentheses. Yeah. So I sort of screwed up here. I started dropping the parentheses. But typically, if you see mod seven parentheses. We're saying we're talking. We're doing mod seven arithmetic here. If you see it without the parentheses, we're talking about a mod operator. So really, I should have put parentheses around all these because we're just talking about inverses in the mod eleven world or the mod eight world. Yeah. Should the raised to negative one go over the mod symmetry? Multiplicative inverse of mod? Or? No, it should say we're asking for the, mod, the inverse of 9 in the mod 11 world. It yeah. almost feels like we should be doing like 1 ninth of mod 11. Well, this is the notation we're going to use. It's just, it doesn't mean 1 ninth. It means inverse mod 11 in this case. Yeah. So, um, as you said, without the parentheses, would, would the other be different at the, the operation? <coughs> well, yeah, with, you know, <coughs> If I say, what is 2 plus 7 mod 3 without parentheses, I'm just saying use the mod operator to simplify 2 plus 7. The, the bottom line is, it's not that big a deal. It's, imagine you're doing a complex modular computation. It's kind of a pain to have to say, to put mods all through the computation to simplify it. It's easier to just say, here's the computation. By the way, we're doing it mod 6. And you just do it all, all the operations mod 6. It's just sort of a way to separate out the modding from everything else. It's not a big, not a, not a huge deal. Okay, 
this was our, the fact that we talked about at the end, that if D divides both A and B, and you can write D in, in that form as A times X plus B times Y, for some integers X and Y, then you know the GCD of A and B. D has to be the GCD of A and B. So uh, here's some examples. A, A, B, 5, so, and, and D, 1. You can prove that 1 is the GCD of A and 5 because you can write, uh, you can write D as 2 times 8 uh, minus 3 times 5. And same thing here. You can show the GCD of, of A and B is 2 because you can write it as negative 1 times A plus 2 times B. And you get D. So that's just a fact that we're going to exploit to compute modular multiplicative inverses. Now, I skipped over this in the interest of time, but let's, uh, let's see why this is true. I want to show that if those first two conditions hold, that D is a GCD of A and B. Well, since D divides both A and B, that's the first assumption up there, D must be less than or equal to the GCD of A and B. Right? Why is that true? Yeah. If it was greater than it would be the GCD, which means it would be equal. Right. And that's impossible. Right. D is a divisor of both A and B. This is the greatest common divisor. Mm -hmm. So D is a divisor. It has to be less than or equal to the GCD. Right. So that's one direction. Here's the other direction. Since the GCD of A and B is a divisor of both A and B, well, the GCD, it, 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 it's the greatest divisor, but it's also A divisor, so it has to divide both A and B. It must also divide AX plus BY. Now, why is that true? Why does the GCD have to divide this thing right here? You can factor out the divisor back to the yeah, I mean, yeah, so just imagine dividing this by the GCD of A and B. It would divide evenly into AX, giving you some integer. It would divide evenly into BY, since it divides A and B. And so the sum would be an integer, so that's a divisor. So it divides that, which is equal to D, so it divides D. And since it can divide D, it has to be less than or equal to D. So you've got it both ways. D is less than or equal to GCD. GCD is less than or equal to D, so they must be equal. Okay, yeah. so that's a, a nice fact that we can uh, that we can exploit here. And so um, here's the deal. Suppose we'd like to find the inverse of A mod n. Now you can't look; you don't even bother looking for that unless the GCD of A and n is one, right? The inverse doesn't exist unless that's true. So we're trying to find the inverse, and that's true. So that means, let's think about looking for x and y such that ax plus ny equals 1. Right, we know those will exist because 1's a GCD. If we could do that, I claim that x is the inverse of a. If we can find an x and a y, such that this equation holds. And we know that we can. We know that x and y exist. When we do find that x and y, such that this equation is true, x will be the inverse. Now, why is that? How can we know that uh, x is going to be the inverse of a? Mod n. <coughs> yeah? So you have a times x, which is one... Uh, product. Uh -huh. and you also have n times y, which is another product. Right. And if y is negative, or even if it's not, um, x and y will have two different signs. And whatever's left over when you add those two together will be 1. Um, so right. what you multiply, I'm trying to figure out how to express this exactly, but what you multiply 8 times um, must be the inverse because when you add or subtract n times y from that, which when you take the mod of that is zero, you end up with one. Okay. So that that's last thing you said, but the last thing you said was getting at it. He, he noticed that n times y mod n is zero, right? <laughs> All right. So take the mod of both sides of this equation. Okay. What's one mod n? 
1, 1, 1. What's AX plus NY? Mod in. AX. AX. Mod in. Right? So AX plus NY mod in. Well, the NY, NY goes away. And you're just left with AX mod in. So taking the mod of both sides of the equation gives you that. Yeah? You say both sides of the equation, and the equal thing you're thinking of. Right? The equal sign, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we just view this equation, you know, this equation, mod in, reduces to this. Because mod in, this is zero. It just goes away. Yeah? After that, you just multiply both sides by a to the minus 1, and then... No, after this, x is the answer. Right? We're looking for the inverse of a, and here we have an equation that says a times x is 1, mod in. So we just have to find the x and the y, and then x is our answer. So that's, that's our algorithm for the inverse. Let's just, just look at it in action. So if we want to know the inverse of 3 mod 13, we need to find an x and y such that 3x plus 13y is 1. And then whatever x we find will be the inverse. Okay? So what works here? Well, if we make x 4, that gives us 12, and then we make y negative 1, then we get negative 1 as our answer. So that's close. Well, should we make x and y to solve that equation? Yeah? Yeah, make x negative 4 and make y 1. And then add 13 to get back. Yeah, so we get negative 4 and 1. So that means negative 4 is the inverse of 3 mod 13. But I don't like to see it in that form. I want to see a positive number. So what do we do? Yeah. Yeah, we just add 13 to shift it into the range that I want, and so that gives us 9. So let's make sure that makes sense. That's supposedly the inverse of 3 mod 13. Well, what's, what's 3 times 9? 27. And 27 mod 13 is 1. So there's our answer. But we have to, so far we've just been finding x and y by the seat of our pants. We need an algorithm to do it. So we're about to look at the algorithm for finding x and y. Before we do that, I'll see if there are any other questions I could answer. Yeah? Can you explain again why this is useful? Like, why, why what is, which, which is useful? Is the modular multiplication inverse. Okay, modular multiplication inverse is useful because it is a, a key algorithm that's used in, in public key encryption. So we're trying to see how public key encryption works. <laughs> And it will involve modular exponentiations, GCDs, and modular multiplicative inverse. Are we going to look at that? Yeah. At that yeah. Algorithm? yeah, we're working our way up to look at, look at the RSA algorithm. Okay. Yeah? Just a quick clarification. So the answer is 9, or the answer is 9 modulo by 3? Oh, this is observing that negative 4 is equivalent to 9 mod 13. The answer is 9. Negative 4 is an answer as well. I just prefer 9 because I like to see answers in that range. Other questions? Okay. Well, here it, it turns out that we can solve for x and y by using what's known as the extended Euclid algorithm. And it looks kind of like a bizarre algorithm at right? first. Um, up there in that box, because what it returns is three things. You give it A and B, it gives you back the G, C, D, X, and Y. So when you see the things in the, in the uh, square brackets, that's, just think of that as what's being, the three things are being returned. So if it bothers you that it returns three things, think of that as a list of three numbers, or an object that holds three integers, or whatever. Okay? And so let's see what happens. So if B is 0, <coughs> it returns 1, 0, and A. Well, let's make sure that makes right, makes sense. 
The first thing in that triple is the GCD. No, the last thing in the triple is the GCD. Look at the comment up there, which I just did. The answer is in the form of X, Y, and D. So is A the GCD of A and B when you get zero? Yeah, that's, anything will divide the zero, and A is the largest thing that will divide A, so that might. And is, are one and zero values for X and Y that work? Right? AX plus BY, what is AX plus BY going to be? times B is 0. The answer is A, and that's supposed to be equal to the GCD. So that's the right thing in that case. Otherwise, what you do is you recursively compute the GCD of B and A mod B. So that's just the same, same as Euclid's algorithm, except in addition to the GCD, I mean, which is D, you get back X prime and Y prime. Okay, so you get these three things back. X Y prime and D is the answer to this question. And then it turns out that uh, you can take the X prime, the Y prime, and the D you get back and use it to create the answer to this question. So the GD is still the same. Uh, use Y prime as X and use this as Y. And I'm not going to try to argue it's correct. There's a proof on the next slide. But uh, I'll, I'll let just people that are interested in it can look at that. Okay. But this is, so it just, what you do is you make a call. You get back three things, you use those three things to create the three things you're returning. It's a straightforward algorithm. It's a little hard to see that it works. And then if that exists, we can do inverses this way. You run extended Euclid, you get the triple back. If D is 1, you know the answer is X. And we'll do X mod in and put it in the right range. If D is not one, you know there's no inverse. <coughs> so let's just see how this works in action. So to compute the GCD of EM13, what recursive call are we going to make? Yeah, so uh, it'll do 13 and 3 mod 13, which is 3. So it just turns out, well, the way Euclid's algorithm works, if the first parameter is smaller than the second parameter, it uh, just flips them. All right, so we're, we're uh, waiting to get an answer back from EE 13.3. So I've skipped ahead on the stack train. So what's EE of 13.3 going to do? Call EE 3.1. Okay, so it's going to call EE of 3 and 13 mod 3, which is 1. So it's going to make that call, and then it's going to get back x prime, y prime, and d, and do something with them. So there's the recursive call. What's e e of 3 and 1? 1 and 3 mod 1. 1 and 3 mod 1. <coughs> uh, 1 and... Yeah, 3 mod 1, which is 0. And that's going to return immediately. Well, so we make that recursive call there. Now we're at the base case. And so what's going to be returned? 1, 0, and 1. one. one. Oh, nice. So we get 1, 0, and 1 back. <coughs> so this is being returned up to here. So now x prime is 1, y prime is 0, and d is 1. And so it's got to compute now what to actually return. So what's it actually going to return? What did we say? y prime was 0. So it'll return 0 right here, comma. Now, what's the last thing going to be? One. one. That's always going to be, the GCD is one straight up. Then it's got to do that. It's got to take x prime, and then it's got to do this integer division, and that multiplication and subtraction. Okay? And if you do that, you get zero. Okay? So this gets returned up to that call, and it's going to do the same thing. Let's see. It's, it's, you know, the last thing will stay one. 
This will become the first thing. This will become the x that's being returned. And then we'll do that complex calculation to get the other one. Uh, so it's returning that. This returns that. This returns that. And we get negative 4 as our answer. Now, I told you last time that there are fewer things sadder than watching a student on the final exam trying to do this algorithm in all its glory to compute the inverse of, say, 3 mod 7. That's a losing proposition. I'd say it's almost impossible to do this algorithm on paper and get it right. There's just so many details to manage. So when it says on the midterm, what's the inverse of 3 mod 7, what I'm expecting you to do is just say, okay, is 2 the inverse? What's 2 times 3? What's 3 times 3? And so on. Find something that works. Yeah? I'm sorry, say it louder. I took a number three class, they did ask this on a test. Okay, well, this isn't a number three class. <laughs> so I'm not expecting you to run the algorithm. I'm expecting you to, to, to be able to do simple inverses easily. So yeah. how come our simple inverses like happen faster? It's like the different algorithm is faster than this one, if that's the case. The one that we do, you mentioned earlier. Which algorithm I mentioned earlier? The one where we would just say is two to multiply. With the inverse and three, and then keep marching up. Yeah, well, I mean, how complex would that algorithm be? So we're sort of testing all the possibilities. Right? What if we had a 600 digit number? How many steps would it take? 600 times 2 to the 600. <laughs> right? So a, you know, a six digit number is. Or a seven digit number, 10, 10 to the sixth is a million. So with six digits, it would take a million steps. It's exponential algorithm. But it works just fine if it's only single digits you're dealing with. So I don't want to see anyone trying to do this algorithm on paper during the exam. It just means that you. you that happens because students, I think, uh, bring the notes someone else created and they see this algorithm and they run it because they've never really thought about doing it. That doesn't cover any of you. Yeah. The other way is just basic Yeah, the other way is just arithmetic. Right? Just simple numbers. I want the inverse of 3 mod 7. So I want something to multiply 3 by that gets me <coughs> one more than multiple of 7. 5 words. 3 times 5 is 15. That's one less than one more than 14. So. Is there any word associated with that, or do we just write the answer? It's almost like. Yeah, no, ask that question on the final. I just want the number that's the answer. Okay? Here's the proof that it works, but I'm not going to, you know, it's, it's not difficult proof. But you can take some time to understand the steps, so I'm just going to fly past that. Okay. So we have these three algorithms in place now. We have um, modular, multiple, modular exponentiation, GCD, and modular multiplicative inverse. So we need one more thing. Um, it turns out that RSA depends on being able to quickly find large randomly generated prime numbers. You need to be able to find random primes of, 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 of large length, like 600 digit, 2,000 bit prime number chosen at random. So we need an efficient way to find random prime numbers. Now, you probably, every now and then, you may notice that there's an article in the paper that says someone has just discovered the largest prime that anyone's ever found. And that happened recently. Okay? But we're not, we're not up in that range. We're not looking for theoretically longest prime numbers possible. We're talking about you know, near 2,000 bit prime numbers. So let's just talk about prime numbers. Um, a prime number is an integer greater than 1 whose factors are, only factors are 1 in itself. Okay? So we've got example 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on. Those are prime numbers. And composites are the other ones, as long as we're talking about numbers greater than 1. All right. Now, uh, <coughs> mathematicians long ago asked this question, is there a largest prime number? And here's a simple proof that there's not. 
So suppose that there, there were only a finite number of prime numbers. So it would be, let's just call them P1 through PK. So imagine that you multiply together those prime numbers, the only ones there are, and added one. Let's think about that. <coughs> would this number be divisible by P1? No. What would you get if you divided it by P1? The You'd get one, right? The remainder would be one. Right? You, you, divide, you divide this through, this would give you a remainder of zero. So you get a remainder of one. So it does not divide evenly. So no prime <laughs> number evenly divides this piece. Okay, so what does that tell you about Z? The fact that none of the prime numbers evenly divide it. Yeah? Prime. It's either prime or it's divisible by some prime number that's not on that list, one or the other. It's either prime or it's not. If it's not prime, uh, it has to have a factor. So that the, one of the, the factor, these things aren't the possible factors. So either way, there's a prime number that wasn't on the list. So there's only a five, there's an infinite number of prime numbers, which is good if you're in the business of wanting to find randomly generated prime numbers. You, you know, you don't want to run out. So there are plenty of prime numbers to look at. Okay, let's think about ways to test if a number is prime. Because our, our basic algorithm is going to be generate at random a prime number of whatever length you want. So if you want a 2,000-bit prime number, we generate a random 2,000-bit integer, and then test it to see if it's prime. And if that doesn't work out, we generate another one at random and test it. Okay? So, let's think of some ways of doing it. What about factoring it? So we test a prime number, we factor it. And if the only, fact, if the only factors are the number in itself, then we say it's prime. Otherwise, we say it's not. What well, could be separate than factoring it? So what do you think of that approach? Yeah? It's simple, but it has a very high complexity. Right. It's simple. It's simple to describe, but no one's ever found an efficient factoring algorithm. Okay? And in fact, the security of RSA, public key encryption, of e-commerce, depends on the assumption that there are no efficient factoring algorithms. If someone were to discover a fast factoring algorithm today, uh, public key encryption wouldn't work anymore. It would be trivial to break. So it's a little bit scary that we no one has proven that there isn't a, an efficient factoring algorithm. Mm. <coughs> but we're sure hoping there isn't. Yeah? As far as testing for prime, if someone solved the Riemann hypothesis, would that like the Riemann hypothesis, I'm not sure what implication that has for testing. You, when you say testing, you're saying, is it prime or is it not prime? Yeah. That's polynomial time, that's AKS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when I say there is a polynomial time, as he just said, uh, <coughs> primality right. test. But there's, uh, it's, uh, that's not the same as factoring. Okay. So that lowers it from to the sixth power to the third power. Okay. So factoring is not going to work. What about doing trial division? So we start at 2 and we say, does, does 2 divide? That doesn't work. Does 3 divide? Does 4 divide? Does 5 divide? I mean, we, don't, we only have to go up to the square root of the number we're testing. That would work, right? What's the problem? Let's see how efficient that is. It would require you know, the square root of P division. That looks like a, not a very bad complexity measure. P to the 1 half. We've been looking at quadratic algorithms. This is a square root algorithm. What's misleading about saying that uh, it only takes that many divisions? Yeah? The, mag or the magnitude of P is exponential with regard to N. Right. The magnitude of the number is exponentially larger than its bit length. When we're talking about the complexity of something, we need to talk about its length. Okay? And the length of P is two, look, if n is the number of bits in p, then p is on the order of 2 to the n times bigger. You know, a 30-bit number, 30 small, a 30-bit number is you know, in the range of a billion. So, 
be honest about it, we need to describe it in terms of the bit length, not in terms of the magnitude. This comes up again. So the, the, uh, if n is the bit length, then p is 2 to the n square root. So we end up with 2 to the n over 2, exponential. Takes an exponential number of trial divisions. So that's no good. All right. In 2002, three computer scientists in India discovered the AKS algorithm. Uh, it started by when they published it, it was an end of the 12th algorithm. And it pretty quickly got turned into an end of the 6th algorithm. So it is a polynomial type algorithm to test whether something is prime. But it's not used in practice because of that end of the 6th. It's too inefficient in practice. Interestingly, AKS, the A was a computer science professor. These two were both students. I believe they were undergraduate students. Okay. You believe they're what? They were undergraduates, just like most of these students. Okay, so theoretically, you can do primality test in polynomial time, but it's not fast enough for practice. So in practice, what is used is a probabilistic test. So there's a way to test and determine that a number is probably prime. Okay? So that means the security of RSA, I mean, RSA generates prime numbers, randomly generated prime numbers. And RSA won't work if the numbers it's generating aren't prime. But there's a finite possibility that when it picks a number, prime number at random, that it's not really prime. So we'll talk about that too. But that, that seems kind of uh, an awkward thing that sometimes it won't work. So we need to study this primality test. That'll be the last piece we need to look at how RSA works. So let's take a few minutes off and then we'll look at, at this primality test. Let's get going again. Okay, so we need, we're going to look at this probabilistic test. Now, here's a cool thing. RSA, it turns out, is, you know, it's based on these algorithms we've been talking about, like Euclid's algorithm, which 
dates 2,500 years ago. It also depends on Fermat's little theorem. Not just to find prime numbers, the, the, the proof that RSA works involves Fermat's little theorem. And this is from almost 400 years ago. So, it, you know, you, you often people think of, you know, sort of pure math, number theory, this sort of useless, no practical importance. This thing sat around for 400 years, it was in number theory textbooks, and it turns out to be at the heart of the way electron, electron, electronic commerce works. So you never know when research is going to pay off. Okay, and this is it. If P is prime, then you look at any number between, uh, you know, from 1 up to P, uh, you take that number to the power of p minus 1, and you take the result mod p, you get 1. All right? That seems kind of off the wall, but let's see how that works. So what we're saying is, if say p is 5, so p is prime, what are we saying? see why it's true, but uh, you may not see why it's useful, but uh, it turns out it's both true and useful. Now, what if P is not prime? What's the theorem say about that? It says nothing. It does not say uh, if P is, if P is, it doesn't say anything about what happens. It doesn't say what, the converse, right? Not the converse, the forget what it's called. Anyway, it's not, it's not saying anything about um, what happens when P is a time. But let's see. Let's take P to be 6. All right, 1 to the 5th is 1. We take that mod 6, we get 1. Well, that's not surprising. It's anything to the first power is going to be 1. That's not very interesting. 2 to the 5th mod 6, we get 2. 3 to the 5th mod 6, we get 3. 4 to the 5th mod 6, we get 4. 5 to the 5th mod 6, we get 5. So in that case, you know, we didn't get 1. And we're always going to get 1 up there, so forget about A, a being 1. But we got non-1s right here. Yeah? So you're saying, like, for every 6 numbers, we'll have, or for every 5 numbers, no, for every 6 numbers, we'll have 1 where it equals 1. But Yeah, yeah but we, just, we just won't worry about this case anymore. It's okay. guaranteed to be 1, no matter what P is. So the hope is, what would be nice is if this were an ironclad test. That we would, uh, that if we could take a, uh, so suppose it were true, not just that you always get one if it's prime, but that you never get one if it isn't prime. What would a, what would a primality test be then? Suppose I ask you if 132 or 133 is prime. What would be a simple primality test if this went both ways? This was an if and only if. How would you test? Yeah? We wouldn't even have to go from 1 to P. What would we have to do? Yeah? Just pick any number. Pick any number. Pick 2. So if I want to know if 133 is prime, I would take. 2 to the 132 mod 133. And if I get back 1, that would mean 133 is prime. If I get back not 1, that would mean that 133 is not prime. But unfortunately, it can fool the test only if A and N are relatively prime. Um, what calls 
because if they're not relatively prime, then we're not going to be finding an inverse. So anyway, now let's talk about that. I don't want to blow right past it. How do we know that a number that is not relatively prime can, can't fool the test? So A and N are not relatively prime. How do you know it can't fool the test? Yep. Is it because the answer will be no every time? Because there is no inverse if the DCD is not equal to 1? Well, not exactly. So what we've got, we're doing a to the n minus 1 mod n. So the, the claim was that we can't fool the test if a and n are not relatively prime. So we're going to assume a, the GCD of a and n is greater than, is greater than And we, we claim that can't fool the test. Okay. Why not? Remember, it, what it means is if, if it does fool the test, then this is going to be equal to 1. Not so how do we know that we can't get this? Yeah? If the GCD is greater than 1, then there's no number for that you can multiply A by mod N that will give you 1. Okay. So what he's saying is the GCD of A and N is greater than 1, like right here. We know that A has no inverse. Right? But we can use this equation here to construct an inverse for A. Look at this and tell me what's the inverse for A. That equation right there is true, yeah. A to the n minus 2. A to the n minus 2. Let's rewrite this as A times A to the n minus 2 mod n. Okay. A times A to the n minus 2, if they're 1, then these are inverses. So if we could get 1 out, then that would imply that A has an inverse. But, it, but uh, it doesn't because of that. So the only A's that can fool the test are ones that are relatively prime to Okay. There are some very rare numbers called Carmichael numbers that fool the test every time as long as A is relatively prime, every possible time. Okay? So 561 is the smallest Carmichael one. It turns out they're extremely rare, but they will fool the test every time that it can be fooled. Except for those, uh, at, if you pick an A at random, it will fool the test at most half the time. Okay? So if we could somehow get rid of Carmichael numbers, then we could put a bound on the probability that we're wrong. We were wrong at most half the time. It uh, turns out uh, we can soup up our approach to deal with Carmichael numbers. So I don't want to explain that, so we'll just ignore them. Yeah? Do we know what about Carmichael numbers makes it to the test? Well, it's just, that's just the definition. Uh, I mean, by definition, Carmichael numbers are ones that fool the test, as opposed to, I don't have any insight into what it is about them that makes them fool the test all the time. Yeah? Just out of curiosity, I remember reading that uh, there's no algorithm that will for sure tell you what number is prime or not. Well, yeah, no, there is there is an algorithm that will sure take the numbers prime or not. Okay. That AKS algorithm I mentioned. Uh, also, trial division will tell you whether it's prime or not. It's just they're not efficient enough to use. Okay. All right. So we're if we're willing to ignore prime Carmichael numbers and just trust me that we can uh, we can do things so they're not a problem. Then we know that if we have an N that we're trying to test for primality and we pick an A at random, what's the probability we're going to get, and we're told that it's uh, possibly prime, what's the probability that it isn't prime? Yeah? At most 50%. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's has a 50% uh, chance or less of being wrong. 
It's, wrong. it's correct at least half the time. Okay, so suppose we do it this way. Suppose to test for primality, we pick k numbers at random, k a's at random between 1 and n. And every time we ask, um, suppose we test, we do the Fermat test, and we find out that every time we get 1 back. So it's really looking like it's a prime number. a sub 1 to the power mod n, we get 1 back. a sub 2, we get 1 back. a sub 3, we get 1 back, all the way up to k. So every time we're, we're told, yeah, it looks, you know, it may be prime. What's the probability we get it wrong? Yeah? 1 over 2 to the k. Yeah, 1 over 2 to the k. So if we just pick one a at random, and, we, and, it, and we're told, yeah, it may be prime, there's a, a one-half chance that that's wrong. But if we do it twice and we get it back, it's one half times one half chance it's wrong, one quarter. So basically, the probability that you get it wrong after doing k tests is the same as the probability that you can flip k heads in a row. Yeah? So is there a point where it becomes inefficient to test for a certain amount of k? Well, you... Yeah, I mean, the more k you pick, you know, the, the time it takes to do the test is going to be dependent on k, right? It's just a matter of how much certainty do you want. So how much certainty is enough? Suppose we did, suppose we took a prime number, took a number, and we picked 100 k, uh, a's at random, did the Fermat test, and each time we got back, yeah, it may be prime. So our chance of being wrong is 1 out of, uh, 1 over 2 to the 100th power. 1 over 2 to the 100. Is that something that you're willing to, is that a, an error rate you're willing to live with. <laughs> I mean, does it bother you that it may be wrong? Yeah? What about that one time it is wrong? That, okay, what about that one time it is wrong? Well, then RSA will fail. Okay? Yeah? Could you use a higher K for, like, more important transactions, or? Suppose, yeah. And this is done in practice. When RSA keys are generated, it's, you pick number, you, you, the first step is to pick two large and prime numbers at random. Yeah? Can you explain what RSA keys are for? Like, how far they? Well, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Right? Yeah? Well, wouldn't we actually find a prime? Can't we just feed it into AKS and accept that big cost just once and then be certain? Uh, no, because it's end of the sixth, and so yeah, the one time cost is too much. <laughs> yeah? You want 95% certainty? I'd like more than 95% certainty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Well, we're picking only about two kilobyte long numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So 2 to 100 is already like way, way, way longer than. Right. One chance in 2 to the 100 is mind-bogglingly low. What else can go wrong with the computer? Besides the algorithm failing one, one time and you know, once in the life of the universe. Transistor. Yeah. Transistor goes wrong. A, you know, static electricity causes a problem. The cosmic ray flips a bit in the memory. All this stuff can happen. <laughs> and stuff like that is way more likely to occur it occurs more often than one every two to the hundredth times, yeah? Does that happen often? Does, does that happen when our computers just somehow recover? And, or does it always like crash? It depends. Depends which bit is flipped and what's being used for. But yeah, I mean, yeah, computers can. Sometimes yeah. it just, yeah. we never even really know. It's crazy. You either you don't know or it just crashes and you, you say, oh, you reboot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what about. A flood destroys a data center, or an asteroid run, you know, hits the data center, a meteor hits the data center. <laughs> right? Lots of reasons that things can go wrong that are far more likely to happen, infinitely, almost infinitely, more, you know, more likely to happen than th this test being wrong. Yeah. So if K is big enough to make this at least the least likely thing to happen, then yeah. that's the best we can do. Right. So, you know, you make it so that it's less likely than lots of other things that we're willing to put up with that are out of our control, and just go forward. Yeah. 
So then what's the cost of every subsequent K test that you do? Is it become costly to make it more and more probabilistically well, sound? You well, know, for, you know, you, you double the number of Ks, you double the amount of work required to test the numbers. Yeah. Reasonable threshold there? Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. Well, let me just tell you a little bit more. So this is what we just said. No more than 1 over 2 to the K. So if K is 100, no more than 1 in that. And we just talked about that. It turns out, though, that you know, it's just in the worst case that you've got a one-half chance of being wrong. Some numbers, you've got a one-half chance of being wrong. Other numbers, it's a one-quarter or one-eighth or less. It turns out, in practice, if you take a large number, hundreds of bits, and just test it for two, three, and five, I challenge you to find a number that, that fools the test. And I gave that as an assignment once without doing it myself. I asked students to sort of, for different links numbers, uh, see what percentage failed uh, you know, fooled the test for 2, 3, and 5. And then I wanted to see a graph that showed, okay, as the numbers get longer, the rate of fooling goes down. But it turned out that the rate of fooling was just zero. Flat across. <laughs> okay? So I think your book calls these industrial strength firms. <laughs> okay? Something like that. Now, so it just turns out that in reality, you, to, get a, to get a really good guarantee that your number is really prime, you don't have to test 100, no, 100 days. Many fewer will suffice. You're picking them around. Okay? So the test is better, better than you think. Right? So I don't know in practice, I haven't researched enough to know, you know exactly how, how many they pick and to get satisfied, but, yeah? So then we talked uh, about Carmichael the numbers pulling the test 100% uh, of the time. And so does that mean that the next like, logical step to improve this would be to find a way to compute Carmichael? Well, it, it, no, it turns out, so the, the, the test uh, that we're doing involves a modular exponentiation, right? We're taking A to the, K minus, uh, a to the N minus 1 module. It turns out that you can modify modular exponentiation to detect whether you're dealing with a Carmichael number <coughs> as you're doing the exponentiation. Hmm. And so you can completely rule out Carmichael numbers. Don't have to worry about it. All right, so here's our plan. To generate a, ran a random input prime number, we generate a random inbit integer. We test it with our is prime method. And we repeat until we find something that's probably prime. And we can, you know, you can control to some extent what, you, know, you decide what risk you're willing to put up. Now, that's nice, but what if, what if n bit prime numbers are extremely rare? That means we've got to test number after number after number after number before we finally luck onto a prime number. So that's, the next question is, how, you know, how common are prime numbers? Yeah. Uh, before you talked about, like, in metabolism, say, somebody's found the biggest uh, prime number. Prime number. Did, did they just accept a certain probability with that as well? No, no, no. When they say they have, they have, <coughs> Proven something, you know, the largest possible prime number. They they've proven it deterministically. Yeah, so maybe through some massively parallel test that took a long time, or there may be uh, theorems they can apply to simplify the search. But yeah, no, it's not it's not probably prime. It really is prime. You can make those pronouncements. But we're talking about you know, billions, trillions, I don't know how many bits. Yeah. Just as long as the transistor didn't go wrong. As, as long as, as, yeah, the computer didn't <laughs> fail while it was doing that. That's true. That is true. Okay. How many prime numbers are there? If I pick a number at random, I pick a thousand bit number at random, what's the probability it's prime? What's the, yeah? What's the density of primes? At well, what's it, it boils down to what's the density of prime numbers? Yeah? I think I read this. Primes become larger. Fewer. That's true. As primes become larger, they become rarer. So they're more common you know, with small numbers than with big ones. Yeah. But we're just thinking about bits here, so it's exponential to magnitude. True. So is it still the same <coughs> density? No, the, it, it becomes less dense as you go up. Turns out there's a Lagrange prime number theorem. 
And this thing, this, this just blows me away. That there is a way to, I don't know how you characterize the density of primes, how you come up with this. But anyway, pi of x is the number of prime numbers less than or equal to x. Just accept that as a definition. It turns out that in the limit, pi of x is equal to x over the natural log of x. Okay? So we'll take that as an approximation to the number of the prime numbers less than or equal to x. So as x gets bigger and bigger, that gets more and more accurate. All right, let's see what we can do now. What's the probability that a k-bit integer is prime? Well, how many k-bit integers are there? Yeah? Two to the k. Two to the k. And how many of them are prime? <coughs> Pi of two to the k. Right? So we let x be two to the k. So there's our... Uh, if we do the math, we basically divide 2 to the k by No, I got that backwards. We divide the number of times pi to the x. Okay, okay. Let me just do it. Okay. Pi of x is, in this case, when x is 2 to the k, it's going to be 2 to the k divided by the natural log of 2 to the k. You get the probability the number is prime, we divide pi to the x by the, the number of primes, the number of, of k-bit primes by the number of k-bit integers, mm. and we get that. And we can do a little bit of simplification to get that. <coughs> so roughly speaking, the number of k-bit, the probability that a k-bit integer is prime is 1.44 divided by k. Well, let's just simplify that to one. Let's just just for just to make it easier. Let's just say the number of prime, the probability a number is prime, a k-bit number is prime, is roughly one over k. So if you're looking for a thousand-bit prime number, you've got like uh, you pick one at random. You got a one in a thousand chance that it is prime. So that means you, you've got some work to do. You've, you've got to, on average, you've got to test 500 k-bit numbers before you find one that's prime. Okay. We accelerate that, like because we know it's not going to be like one half. It's not going to end. Okay, so right. So let's not pick even numbers. Mm -hmm. So that cut, cuts it down to five hundred. Right. right. That cuts that cuts the search space in half. Yeah. So there are tricks you could do, but the point is that as the numbers get longer, the the prime numbers get rarer. Furthermore, as the numbers get longer, the cost of running the test gets more gets, goes up, right? And also, like. Like most encryption algorithms, RSA is subject to a brute force attack. You just try all the possibilities and all the possible keys and try to decrypt something. And so the defense against computers getting faster and faster and using a brute force attack is to make the keys longer. So as time goes on and attacks get more sophisticated, the key length used in RSA and other algorithms gets longer, which makes the algorithm ever, more, ever less efficient. So at some point, RSA becomes... At some point in the future, RSA will become too inefficient to use because the number links will become too long. Uh, there are other public key encryption techniques that could be substituted in at that point. Yeah? Well, and I think even before we get to that point, we might have efficient Well, that's, that's, that's the other point is that there is an efficient quantum algorithm for factoring. So if we were to... You know, you get a functioning quantum computer running a quantum factoring algorithm, then RSA would, would die as well. <coughs> so, at some point, RSA will become useless, but right now, it's, it's not. Yeah? Uh, you had mentioned this earlier, but what is it about the primes that are good for... Okay, so, I keep getting variations of this question. On that. <laughs> what good are... Why do we want to identify large prime numbers? Why do we want to compute inverses? Why do we do GCD? Why do we want to do... Modular exponentiation. It's all, these are the raw ingredients to the RSA algorithm. Okay? And um, just so that we can, uh, I want to, since, since I keep getting this question, <laughs> I'm going to show you, also because you need to know this for the next CADIS problem, we'll come back and do this <laughs> later. Turns out RSA isn't. Alright, there's, 
there's more to say to build up to this, but this is the RSA algorithm. Uh, you select two distinct prime numbers. Nowadays, each it needs to be at least 10, 24 bits long. All right, that's the prime number part. Multiply them. Okay, we can multiply larger numbers. Compute this other number phi, which is p minus one times q minus one. We know how to do that. You pick a small integer e and find one whose GCD with phi is one. So you got to try some small numbers to find, uh, you know. So we got to do GCDs. Then we find the modular multiplicative inverse of e mod phi. So there's our modular multiplicative inverse. Okay. Then that gives you the keys to use. So uh, E and N are called the public key. D and N are called the secret key. And again, uh, I, you know, there's groundwork I want to lay before I explain this again. And then, once you do that, encryption is modular exponentiation. To encrypt something, you do, you're encrypting your message X, you do X to the E mod N. That's your encrypted version. To decrypt it, you do, so if Y is the encrypted version, you do Y to the D mod N. D and N, D and N. So there's all our algorithms in use to do RSA. This is called an RSA key pair. I have a lot more to say about that. But if someone on a CADIS problem asks you to compute an RSA key pair, there's the recipe. Right? There's more understanding to come, but the mechanics are straightforward. That's why we're studying all that stuff. Yeah? So does it work because in order to break it, you'd have to find, get that to test every prime number? It is believed. It is believed one way to break it is to factor in. If you factor in, you've got P and Q and the game's over. It is believed that there's no better way to attack RSA than to attempt to factor in. And so that's why a fast factor algorithm would kill RSA, because you can factor in, you can reconstruct the keys. Okay? Uh, one last question. So, some people worry that some organization like the NSA may know how to do this. <laughs> but that would be a conspiracy. You know, it would be such a groundbreaking development that to keep it secret. It's hard to imagine staying secret for 